Thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this really, really interesting uh, discussion today. Um, I would like to add something to that, and I would like to add to it how our worldview currently is changing again. Because we're going through a, a revolution. We can have the talk. So my talk is entitled Thousands of New Worlds. And we are just right now changing our view of our place in the universe again. And I will link this back to sustainability, the topic of our conference today, because as I mentioned before in the question and answers, one of the fundamental goals of looking for life in the universe or finding planets like ours out there, one of them is finding out if we're alone in the universe, but the second one is learning enough to safeguard our own planet better by seeing many, many more other planets. Oops. Can I have my slides back? Oh, oh, come on. Yeah. I'm sorry, I think I have never given a talk sitting down. Don't worry. I'll stay here. So, I wanted to start with our place in the universe, with our place in the solar system, really. So when you have a look at this picture, you are reminded of the image we saw before, looking up in the sky, and you see all these other stars. And our galaxy alone hosts 200 billion stars. And as you were told before, from scientific research, we now know that at least every second star hosts at least one planet. And I have to make it in this caveat because we haven't found the smallest planets yet. They're incredibly hard to spot. And Earth, if you put it a hundred times next to each other, that's when you get the diameter of the sun. So finding an Earth, a tiny, tiny dot next to a bright star is incredibly difficult, even with the telescope we have today. So we haven't found all the small planets out there yet. So I have to say, every second star has at least one planet, but we also have found out that every fifth star in the night sky, so when you go out tonight, I hope you'll just count to five, Every fifth star has a planet that is the right size to be a rock, plus it is at the right distance that it could be a habitat like our own world. And so with 200 billion stars in our galaxy alone, every fifth one of those could host another Earth. We're in for an incredibly surprise when we finally get to actually analyze and characterize these new worlds. And I show you how we do that. So our place in the solar system, here's the sun. These are the four inner planets. We are the third rock from the sun. So it's Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. And then outside, you find this big giant planets, the big gas balls. And the difference is that if you had a huge cosmic bathtub, and you would throw in the Earth, it would sink because its mean density is higher than water. If you would throw in Saturn, Saturn would swim. So the mean density of planets in the outer solar system is much lower than the one in the inner solar system. That, of course, informed, compelled our understanding of how planet formed. Close to the star, it's very hot. So you lose all ice and gas, they evaporate. So you only have a little material left that forms these small rocky planets. And further out, where it's cool enough, so you're far enough away from the star, that the ice and the gas does not evaporate, you form these big giant planets. And this is what we knew, and this is how we knew that we'd fit in, until about 20 years ago. But this solar system that I just showed you, one of the questions that I wanted to ask is how our own Earth actually looks like. And this is Voyager 1 that was started, launched 39 years ago. Next year, we're going to have the 40th anniversary of the Voyager launch. And it went out 
to the distances of Jupiter and Saturn and looked back at the Earth. And building on the beautiful imagery we saw in the talk about the whole, solar, whole universe, you'd expect this beautiful continents and oceans and clouds, but because you're so far away, this is what you get. This is up to the date today the furthest away image of our own planet that we have. And this dot here is our own planet. This is the Earth seen from a distance like Saturn. And if you take our whole solar system and you put it in your spiritual eye to the size of a cookie, then the next star is two football fields away in that scale. So, with the technology that we launched in the 70s, in 77 we launched Voyager, we could see this pale blue dot, this tiny dot of our planet within our solar system. But with telescopes we have currently available, we can see them around other stars. They are not as small as the Earth yet, because we need even more powerful telescopes to find such small planets. But we have the first pictures of worlds that orbit not our sun, but alien suns that you see in the sky. But how do we find most of these planets? Most of them we can't see. Most of the thousands of worlds we have discovered, actually we've never seen. And the funniest part in this, in a way as scientific revolutions go, we knew that the small planets had to be close to the sun, and we knew that the big planets had to be far out. So the first planet we found about 20 years ago was roughly as big as Jupiter. Jupiter is an 11-year orbit around the sun. The star is the same size as our sun, so you have every reason to expect that it would be in an 11-year orbit. But we actually found it in a 4.5-day orbit. So Monday to Friday afternoon. And we know that they cannot form there because it's too hot, there is no gas and ice material. So the first detection was completely scrutinized. People were thinking that detection cannot be real because the planet cannot be there. But it taught us that planet can form out here and then actually migrate, spiral inwards towards the star so you can find a gas planet close in or you can find rocky planets further away from the star. Our own solar system so far seems to be unique among the ones we found, but it's also a bias in what we can find. The bigger the planets, the easier it is for us to find planets out there. So we can pick up big planets like Jupiter, Neptune, Uranus, and Saturn close to their star much easier than we can pick out things like the Earth. This is how we find these unseen planets. We actually don't see the planets most of the time, but we see the star move because the planet gravitationally pulls on it. That's the radial velocity method, so the Doppler shift of the light from the star tells you that a planet tucks on it, and the star basically moves to counter that orbital movement of the planet around it. And if by chance the planet actually goes in front of the star and blocks part of the light of the star, we see that the star periodically becomes a tiny bit dimmer every time the planet goes between us and the hot stellar surface and blocks part of the hot stellar surface from our view. But a second thing happens when that happens. And you see that in the animation down here. When the planet goes in front of the star, yes, the light of the star darkens, but part of the stellar light actually gets filtered through the planetary atmosphere before getting to us. And that allows us, in these transiting planet cases, to read the atmosphere, the chemical composition of the atmosphere on those planets, already with current technology for big, giant planets. But with the next generation of telescopes that we're building right now, the James Webb Space Telescope that's going to go up in 2018, the follow-up of Hubble, and the 40-meter European extremely large telescope that was started in 222 in Chile, we will be able to do analog observations for small Earth-like planets around close-by stars for the first time being able to figure out if there are signatures of life 
on planets orbiting alien suns. But if you think about it, it's much easier to find the big massive planets, whether the star wobbles because of the gravitational pull, or whether you block part of the stellar surface. But this is the data, this is what the data shows so far. On the bottom you see the radius of the planet, so 11 is Jupiter, and one of course is the Earth. And on the y-axis you see how many planets there are out there. And I've shaded the region where we're not complete yet. What that means is, as I said before, we just haven't found all the smallest planets yet because we don't have the capability or the sensitivity to find them yet. But what you see is that we find many more small planets than big planets out there, even though the big planets are much, much easier to find. What that tells you is that there's ab an abundance of small planets out there, and if they're right at the right distance, they are potential places for life to develop like we know it or like we don't know it. We have about 3,400 confirmed planets so far in the last 20 years of search. We have more than 4,000 planetary candidates that we are confirming, and every day, every month, they're going to get more. So this is not individual objects we're talking about anymore. We now have a statistical sample that tells us about the property of planets, that tells us how our own planet fits into this diversity of worlds out there. And if you want to look at it in a different way, this is the radius of the planet. So here's Earth, Neptune, and Jupiter. And this is the orbital period, how long it takes the planet to go around the star, and therefore smaller orbital period means they're usually hotter. And so you see that even though we find the bigger one easier, there's a pileup of the small planets down here, even to sizes below Earth. We can find those if we look at stars that are smaller than the Sun, because an Earth-sized planet dims more light from a star smaller than the Sun, percentage-wise, than it dims light from a star as big as the Sun. But the diversity of worlds doesn't end here. But if you have a look, this is the radius of the planet in Earth's radii, and this is the mass of the planets in Earth's masses. And this is a graph from three weeks ago, because I wrote the uh, review for astronomy and astrophysics on this topic. But what you see here, and it's a bit complicated, is you see the Earth and Venus as two dots here on, uh, on one and one is the Earth, and then Venus is a little bit to the left. But what you see is like for constant density, a planet would have to follow this curve. This is a constant density curve in a mass radius diagram. And in our own solar system, we have the rocky planets interior, right? And then we have the gaseous planets up here that have a lot of hydrogen and helium. But what we find in these hundreds of other worlds out there is the distribution of density is not as clean cut as it is in our own solar system. And this is what I called, talked about when you have this bathtub, like smaller than water or density higher than water. There seems to be a density distribution of kind of anything you can make is out there within the allowed uh, boundaries of physics. And so we are finding ourselves faced with a diversity of worlds that is beyond anything we ever accept, uh, expected. And of course, that's the fun part of it, because if something new comes along, this is when you learn most. So let me show you this in comparison another way. This is our own solar system, and the distance of our planets from the, uh, from the sun. And so you see that our planets, this is again Mercury, Venus, the third one is the Earth, and then you have Mars out here. This is roughly how they are spaced. And when I was in university, I learned that this is the only spacing that is allowed for planets, that you couldn't fill it any closer. Let me show you 300 planetary systems that we have found so far. And this is, of course, an imagery, but what you see is that the distribution of planets, and especially the packing of planets, how tight you can pack them, is much denser than what is in our own solar system. Why? We don't know. You also see that some of the big planets are inside and some of the small ones are outside, uh, or the reverse, like in our system, the bigger planets are out there. And so if you ask me right now, is our solar system the norm? 
among all the ones we found, it is definitely an outlier. But that is because our methodology, how we find planets, find the one that are close to the star much, much faster. Because if you need the NASA telescope and you want to observe for one year to find an Earth around a sun-like star, you want to observe every night, good luck with getting that proposal through. If you want a week, it's much more likely you're going to get that. So planets that only need four or five days to orbit their star are much easier to find. And this is just a zoom in on some of the weird worlds, but anyway, this is an artist's impression on real data. So let me go back to how do we now characterize them? We have a mean density. That's our first idea of what these planets are like. But what you, of course, would like is a beautiful view with oceans, continents, and clouds of this planet. But this is how our own planet looks like within our solar system. We haven't even left our solar system yet. So if you go further out, the point is just going to become smaller and dimmer. But what you can always do with light, what astronomers always have used, is actually split it in its colors to see what absorption features are in the light and therefore know what light hit before it got to you and therefore know the chemical makeup of a planet. So really, the light that you get from a planet is a spectral fingerprint, a light fingerprint that can tell you what the characteristics are on those planets and whether there's life on them. So the life fingerprint, if you look at the Earth, is the combination of oxygen or ozone with a reducing gas like methane. Because if they are concurrently in the atmosphere, they react with each other and they would produce CO2 and water. So when you still see them, oxygen or ozone, with methane, what that tells you is that something right now is producing oxygen in huge amounts as well as methane. And oxygen, we have no way of producing oxygen in huge amounts on a warm planet except for life. And so this is a very conservative but very solid uh, fingerprint of life on another planet modeled on our own Earth. Now, we have other planets like Venus that do not show uh, the spectral fingerprint of life. So if you want to compare it, this is the Earth, the blue line here. You see water, ozone. This is in the infrared, so you also see the temperature of the surface you're observing. And then here is the methane feature. When you look at Venus, you only see CO2 features. When you look at Mars, you only see CO2 features. And I agree completely with Stephen that I would like to avoid this planet to only show deep CO2 features too, because I really like our planet. And I think safeguarding it from climate catastrophe is one of the things that we are tasked to do for our generations and way more than three generations in advance. So if we have a look at the history of the Earth, we just looked at Mars, Venus, and the Earth right now. We know that life formed pretty early on. The oldest traces of life we sure of about 3.5 billion years ago. Oxygen started to be produced at 2.7 billion years ago. And you can think about this as a 24-hour clock. So life started around 3 a.m. Oxygen built up around lunchtime. Land plants start uh, around 10 o'clock at night. And humans are a couple of seconds before midnight on this clock. So when you go out and search for life, you can decide to search for human life, but then you're narrowing your choice incredibly. Life has been on the Earth for a long time, and it evolved with the environment. So this is an early Earth environment, of course, an artist's impression. Then if you go further in time, when oxygen starts to get produced, and this is what we currently know, and what I usually teach my students is like, if anybody were to offer you a ride in a time machine, the first and only thing you need to bring, if you can bring one thing, is a gas mask, not a camera. Because you'll open, if you go back in time, you open the door of the uh, time machine and you will die because you cannot breathe the atmosphere of an early Earth. There is no oxygen. And then there was really only small amounts of oxygen. They seem to remember that pretty well. <laughs> of course, that coincides with what kind of life we had. Simple life early on. And then once oxygen was available, there was multicellular life that, pr that got created because of the electrical gradient and the energy you can get out of oxygen. 
and then of course potentially intelligent life on this planet as well. But all of this generates a specific spectral fingerprint for the Earth. Early on, you don't see oxygen and methane, even so there is life, but early life, simple life, only made CO2 and methane. So I can't tell you, when I only have light from the planet reaching my telescope, whether the CO2 and methane is made by life or whether it's made by geology. So it's you're not a unique feature for life. But about two billion years ago, the combination of ozone and methane, or oxygen and methane, actually tells you that there's life on a planet. So if anybody had about five to ten years more NASA budget and looked at us from far away, they could, for about two billion years, determine there's life on our planet. Let me go a little bit further than that on the last couple of minutes. So I said we have a spectral fingerprint for life for our own planet. But what about if life is different, what it most likely is? Why should it evolve, if it evolves, completely like it does on our own Earth? And so we know life forms on our own planet that could be the dominated life forms. If it were a bit more acid, a bit colder, a bit hotter, they live in niche environment on our own planet, but they could strive. So if we're not careful with our planet, we can easily be replaced by something that can actually happily live in a very hot CO2 environment. So, could you spot what kind of life you could find on another planet? And one key to that is actually the colors of another world. You can think about, for example, an uh, algae bloom of red algae that covers the whole planet that would make the planet look different to us in colors than an Earth analog. And so, there will be, for sure, a diversity of life and worlds out there, a diversity of worlds out there, and then hopefully a diversity of life that we can spot. And I just use samples from life on the Earth, from the depth of the ocean, because this looks really cute, to extreme forms of animals. This is a tardigrade. And they've taken it to, the, to space, opened the hatch, put it out for three days, no protection, took it back in, vacuum of space took it back in, three degrees, Kelvin. Took it back in, put water on it, and it happily waddled along and laid eggs, and it was fine. So there are weird kind of lives even on the Earth. You can boil this, you can freeze this, you can let it dried out, lie in a museum for 250 years, and then put water on it, it'll be fine. So they're trying to figure out if we can use some of this for the astronaut program, because that would help a lot. No no life system, and then also you don't have to worry about any shielding of astronauts. You just bring a little bit of water and drip it on them when they get to Mars. Let me bring this back to the idea of sustainability. So we learn with every new planet we find out there, we learn something fundamental about planets. How, for example, tectonics works, how carbon and silica cycles work, and right now, we luckily don't have a reason to leave yet, but our sun, like every other star, actually gets brighter with time. So what you see here is our sun when it's gonna be at the end of its evolution in about six billion years, and it will be bigger than the orbit of the Earth. So if you stand on the Earth, you could reach out and touch the surface of the sun. It would be really unhealthy, but you could do that. So. The sound that is nice and warm, the temperate sound, currently the habitable sound is where the Earth is in it, the warm sound where there's liquid water on the surface of a planet, but with time, it moves outwards, so it will move to Jupiter and Saturn and hopefully defreeze the icy moon, so if life were to be on the uh, subsurface oceans, it could strive for about half a billion years. So hopefully, we'll have the technology to go there, drill a hole in the ice and look way before that. But the habitable sound, habitable conditions on this planet are temporary due to the evolution of the star. Let's try to not make it more temporary because we actually add greenhouse gases to our atmosphere and so shift this habitable sound outwards on our own account, not just due to the stellar evolution. So, with thousands of new worlds, we are changing, we are completely, fundamentally changing our view of our place in the universe, whether we're unique, 
whether we're common, again, I can't tell you that yet, w because we wouldn't have been able to pick up system like ours, planetary system yet, but we are very close to doing that. And we're learning from the other worlds how ours works in details, because you need more data to constrain things like the evolution of uh, tectonics on a planet and so on and so forth. And usually the example is, if you found a hundred Earths out there, and they were all older than us, and all of them showed features of SO2 in our atmosphere, it's a gas we can breathe. That does not mean that the Earth will have that, that will happen to us, but it will mean that it will be very smart to develop a technology that could actually filter out SO2 of the atmosphere in case this happens to every other Earth. And because Martin was saying adventure is supposed to be part of the game, I want to leave this with a beautiful poem that I found. And so, taking into account that our star is changing, and it is the cradle of humanity, a cradle that we should safeguard, I love this poem because it says, one day, from the shores of a new world, we'll gaze at the sea that took us there, and its waves, will be made out of stars. Thank you very much.